And I will give five minutes additional to the next speaker, who I think is Gary. Who's going to be introducing Gary? Me, I guess I'm going to be introducing <laughs> Gary Ginsburg from the Department of, of uh, <clears throat> Health at, at Connecticut. Gary, come on up and, and tell us about uh, some of the aspects of the way we can introduce this topic to a wide audience. So, <clears throat> you know, we are now uh, dealing with a lot of groundbreaking kinds of information coming to us, and we are really uh, at the ground floor opportunity to um, iterate. You know, we, we talk a lot about how the science needs to um, constantly be aware of what the science is needed to do and to adjust and iterate so that it is as useful and responsive to the needs of policymakers, decision makers. My job in the next 10 minutes is to give us all as we get geared up to be part of that iteration, to be the embodiment of it, um, is so that we can think about the different ways that the data is coming, are coming to us, the different ways that we may be thinking about using it, what are the decision contexts which these kinds of data streams can inform, and the key concept is not so much are the uh, data good for this or that or the other application, but what's the level of confidence that the regulatory people or the industry people or the non-governmental organizations, the consumers, the media, um, the, the folks developing new bioassays, what's the level of confidence that we need to have in something to be able to use it for this or that kind of decision. So, I figured out how to use this. Is there a button that I'm supposed to press on? Sorry, what, I was not. The green button. The, just the green, wow. <laughs> okay, except I went too far. Can I go back one? The red button? The red button? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So uh, I have listed some of who we are and who we need to be speaking with um, on the left side. And the right side is just this sort of triangular, for lack of any other uh, shape, uh, uh, whether we have a lot of confidence or minimal confidence in something. It has a lot to do with how we're going to be using the information. Some of the emerging data there's a lot more confidence in it. For example, the AIMS test, an in vitro assay that's used broadly for screening, broadly for decision making. Uh, we have a lot of confidence in uh, how to use it. For some things that are newer and more emergent, we may not have the same level of information or confidence. And on the left side are the different kinds of decisions that different types of uh, people may need to be making for example, from screening and prioritization to designing new testing criteria that everyone will be uh, using, grabbing onto, and submitting data surrounding requirements for new compounds, et cetera, uh, that will, the, the regulatory system will be looking for. So what, what kinds of information, what kinds of confidence can fit these different needs, whether it's TSCA, pesticide approvals, whether it's standard setting, very quantitative, qualitative information, quantitative information. In an emergency responder situation where there's urgent decisions that need to be made on some data poor chemicals that may be being created as we speak, uh, when where you don't have a lot of options in terms of data streams, maybe our level of confidence in the information coming to us will be different than if we're trying to set a, um, a standard that's going to apply across the country, site-specific versus nationally um, uh, applicable. Uh, in, uh, in industrial settings where we're screening new compounds, maybe our level of confidence is at one place that we need to, to do that activity with versus having a criteria that we're uh, submitting to a regulatory agency 
we might need to have a different level of confidence. And, and of course, consumers and non-governmental organizations and you know, the rest of society that's receiving this information that has to decide what product to buy, is that water, drinking water of a suitable quality, recycled water streams are a big issue coming down the path. Uh, how much confidence do we need to have in, in the information we're generating on these environmental health uh, areas so that we can make decisions about them? And where, do we, where does confidence come from? Okay, where does uh, confidence come from? Well, the information, we ideally will be predictive, going from in vitro to in vivo. Uh, ideally, we'll know whether there's a lot of false positives or false negatives. We'll at least have that much information and grounding in, in actual case examples. Um, the information coming to us, will, it would, it, its confidence level will help if it's logical in terms of mechanism, makes sense. Uh, whether the information coming to us covers the range of vulnerability and variability that we're concerned about um, in public health. Are there case studies of prior successes where these kinds of data streams have been successfully applied? And aside from the qualities of the data, there's also the backdrop upon which we're applying it. The social, psychological determinants of what we all come to the equation with. What are our expectations? What are our needs to be convinced that this information is something we can base decision making on? So that's, I think, all part of what we're going to be hopefully uh, dialoguing and wrestling with today as we think about the case studies. And um, I'm still not sure where to point this. But it seems like if I do it five times, it works. Four times doesn't work. And uh, a general context is anyone working in the area of human health risk assessment knows that public health decisions based upon risk assessment have a lot of limitations. There's data gaps, gaps in our understanding of a variety of different scenarios, mixtures, aggregate risk, the, uh, gaps in mechanistic understanding when we try to go from high dose to low dose, when we try to characterize the system's biology of what a chemical may be doing either alone or in uh, a combination of other chemicals, uh, endogenous and exogenous. So uh, gaps in our understanding of vulnerability and from a general construct, uh, how can the new information help in any or all of these areas? What is the level of confidence we need in this new information to help us uh, make advances in any of these areas that can support better decision making. Three, four, okay, that was four. And what kinds of, uh, what kinds of decisions can these, this new information inform? In terms of qualitative decision making, that's one level. Is, it, is the chemical a carcinogen, a mutagen, an endocrine disruptor? These kinds of qualitative decisions may be somewhat easier sometimes for the new data streams to inform us. When we get to uh, more quantitative types decision, type of decisions, standard setting, cost benefit analysis, where we really need to know more about dose response, for example, uh, that may be at a different level of understanding, different level of confidence to be able to do that. And then, of course, what kinds of decisions in terms of is the assay for humans? Is it more for ecological risk? Does it have other types of applications that would help in decision making, but it's not in those categories? So three, four, there we go. Uh, we're going to be taught, we're going to have a case example in a workshop uh, topic on Tosca. And Tosca really does have a mandate now with the new, uh, the new uh, updated TOSCA in terms of decreasing animal use, decreasing data gaps, increasing efficiency. Uh, there needs to be an emerging strategy on how to integrate new data streams uh, to evaluate data poor chemicals in the existing inventory to evaluate new chemicals. So there's a lot of focus on how TOSCA is going to grapple with and apply the new information. So we're looking at Tosca as sort of a place for leadership in this area. 
And uh, just, I put up there, consumer products is just one of the areas, one of the uses of chemicals that are particularly uh, poignant for Tosca to grapple with what's the level of information we need uh, to be able to make decisions on all sorts of chemicals coming through that may have that kind of application. Replacement of animal testing, what is enough evidence? We've seen some examples we'll be talking about in this workshop on endocrine disruptors, uh, on the use of in vitro screens for acute packages by EPA's Office of Pesticides, and there's other examples. So it, the, the train is already leaving the station. We're already using this information in some regards. What are the keys to those cases that make them uh, important and make them, um, what are the lessons from those that can help us know how to use this information? And when we start using this new information, I think a key question is how do we integrate the new information into existing programs and databases? For example, we all know how to think about hazard based upon an LD50 in a material safety data sheet. Can an in vitro cytotoxicity uh, LC50 be used the same way? Or how do we relate one type of data to another that we already know how to use and uh, is well accepted? I've already talked a little bit about emerging emergency response. It ranges from brand new uh, on the spot created chemicals that may be combustion byproducts to chemicals we may intentionally want to use and we're not sure which is the best, safest chemical to use out in the environment, uh, like a, a dispersant to break up an oil spill. And how can, again, the, what's the level of confidence needed to make decisions about can we set limits? Do communities need to be evacuated? Uh, to, uh, which uh, is the best dispersant to use? Uh, what's the level of confidence in all of these kinds of decision making? Uh, in terms of environmental quality, uh, can we use bioassays? Um, high, rapid, high throughput information to determine not just what are the levels of PPCPs, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, in a sample of recycled water, but what's the bioactivity of that water? And we're going to be hearing a case example about that. Uh, and there's many, uh, right now there's people, there, there's uh, information coming to us about house dust and the uh, level of obesogens in, in, in house dust. How do we interpret that information? How do we apply it to consumer products, the built environment, and going forward in making decisions and doing better research in these areas? So in summary, uh, I think that this is going to be a really productive, iterative, important to, to get the information back out to the research community to, uh, to day and a half. Uh, many decisions need to be better informed, and the advanced toxicology, the plethora of information that's coming to us uh, is, is emerging. We're being confronted with it on a daily basis in all the publications we're seeing. Tosca may lead the way. We're already seeing it advancing in some of the decisions that have already been made. And today's workshop, where and how can the new methods be useful? Another question is, what is the level of confidence needed? And how is this confidence and acceptance achieved? And how can we all be part of the iteration to make this, um, to make this really more um, and more of a reality as this information goes forward? So. I look forward to this, the robust breakout sessions that should be building on the case studies. Thanks.